Welcome and welcome back. We are here with a review of the latest uh, episode of The Mandalorian, Season 2, chap Chapter 12, Episode 4, The Siege, however it is that you want to refer to this episode. I'm not a TV guy, so I have to uh, admit that this part of these reviews gives me a great deal of consternation. I am not sure exactly how to refer to the episode. Uh, S2, or S2E4, Season 2, Episode 4, The Siege... The Mandalorian episode four, season two, uh, chapter twelve. I, this is all new to me. This is all strange to me. So if I screw it up, hey, uh, I am new and foreign to the Star Wars saga in general. So screwing things up is no new occurrence on this series. Um, and I do still have all of the reviews from season one to uh, upload. I apologize. Uh, this was a good episode. I don't know if this was a great episode. There were two glitches in my uh, episode that I don't know I understand because I've got the little scrolly bar at the bottom and I can see what happened during the parts that were skipped. And I, spoilers, by the way, I know I should have said that earlier, but spoilers, this is a spoilers review. I know that there were, uh, there was an appearance by Moff Gideon, but I have no idea what it was that Moff Gideon actually did in this episode because I can't see it. And there was another glitch during the escape from what was the Stormtrooper stronghold where they got the little bit of, uh, where they got the new ship uh, that's going to bring a lot of money on the black market, by the way. I had a glitch where they were, where Cara Dune was driving that thing. What the hell is wrong with my glasses? My shirt must be greasy. I'm just smearing Oh, there we go. Stuff across them. Um, but where do we want to start with this? So I will start with a gripe. I don't have a whole lot of gripes with this show. I even like the episodic format where it's sort of a an adventure of the week sort of thing without a whole lot of um, master storyline across the arc, uh, at least so far. As we look back on episode or season one, there was a little bit more of a grand storytelling than it seemed at the time uh, with things that ended up coming back at the end of the season and maybe that's where we're going to get with this but uh, I will take umbrage with the fact that we're seven minutes in to the playtime of a I believe 40 something minute 39 minute 40 minute episode we're seven minutes in before anything happens because we've got the recap we've got the intro we've got a short little stinger um, and then we have the title and by the time we get anywhere, we're seven minutes in. Add to that the fact that five minutes of this 40-minute, 39-minute playtime is credits on. Uh, so you're looking at 13 minutes or 12 minutes right there where nothing happens. Um, I'm starting to get a little bit perturbed by that. I'm starting to get pissed off early in the episode, which does not help the fact that I have Spectrum Internet. Spectrum Internet does not stay connected for more than three and a half minutes at a time, it seems. And I have to reconnect to the Internet several times during every episode, which I'm I'm getting pissed off at a lot of things now. I, I notice that. I understand that. Um, but that is uh, the first contention that I have with this. One of the first things that we see in this episode is where Cara Dune is breaking into what looks to be just a gangster's den. Um, not a whole lot of explanation there except for the things that uh, we the uh, end line we get as she has fought off a ferret and is attempting to leave she says I have to take these people's things back to them letting us know that we're we're basically just in a, a bad guy's den but there were two things that happened in that um, number one early in my college days one of my um, assignments in an in a history class was to interview a war veteran and the guy that I interviewed was named Jim, and he had been in Vietnam. So it was interesting to see a tactic employed, which was described to me um, as a war tactic that Jim was introduced to in Vietnam. And that is when she set her ambush and the first guy comes out. Um, one of the things that they would do in Vietnam when there was an ambush you're lined up under under cover, and a a patrol walks past. You don't start shooting as soon as you see them. 
There's no point in that. You've got a line of def a, a line of ambushers, and the ambushes come along, and you wait until here. That way, this guy fires on this guy, and this guy fires on this guy, and you just spray back and forth. Now, the tactic that sort of overlaps with what it is that Cara Dune does here is that she doesn't just wait until that first guy comes out and shoot him, and then all of a sudden everybody's up in arms. She takes him. So she lets him cross her face until he is apprehendable. And then she takes him, uses him as cover. I just thought it was interesting. Also, in that, there's this small part where Cara Dune does a, a roll into a fireman's carry. I don't know how this serendipity worked out the way it did, but earlier in the week, there was a video on YouTube suggested to me, and of course I clicked it, and it was a guy showing off that very, that very move, I don't know what to call it, where he, he set someone down, so he, the, he set someone down whom was bigger than he is, uh, and the, way, the, the reason he did that was because he says, okay, he took a, a little guy and a big guy, and he said, big guy lay down, little guy try and pick him up, so you can carry him back. Couldn't do it. He said, told the big guy to be dead weight. Um, and then he, f he rolled, he did a roll on top of the guy on the downward part. He grabbed the leg and flipped over and just stood up with him. It was the goddamnest thing I've ever seen, but it's just the way serendipity works, the way YouTube works. That video was suggested to me earlier this week in this episode of the Mandalorian, Cara Dune employs that strategy. So it was interesting to see, um, just a weird thing. Just a weird thing. Makes you wonder how these algorithms really work. Are they AI seeing into the future? I don't know, but uh, I had to get that off my chest. Otherwise, I would feel like I was going crazy. The third thing I'd like to talk about there is in this season, a whole lot of leaving baby Yoda behind. I have to believe, I have to, have to, have to, have to, have to believe that what's going on here is we are setting up the fact that this se this series is going to continue without Baby Yoda. Why does this mean this? I am not the first to observe that during the off season, between seasons of The Mandalorian, there was a whole lot of talk about how this is the Baby Yoda show uh, co-starring some guy in metal armor. For this series to continue without Baby Yoda, the Mandalorian would have to reclaim ownership of what seems to be the titular spot. Now, the titular spot, it has been um, rumored, it has been concluded by many, myself included, that the Mandalorian is not just in reference to Dinjarin, Jindarin, Dinjarin. Dinjarin. We've heard it once. Cut me some slack. Uh, is not just in reference to Din Djarin, but the Mandalorian also will refer to Baby Yoda if Baby Yoda decides to take, what the hell's going on here, uh, part in the Mandalorian culture. As I close my computer, this making sound for no reason. Um, but all of the episodes so far this season, and we're four in, we are four in in Patrick Mahomes fashion, we are four episodes into this season, and Baby Yoda has been left behind, I believe, in all of them. Uh, has been set aside in all of them, has been uh, left in someone else's care in each of these episodes. So that is interesting if we are still under the impression of, if we are still under the impression that this season, this series, is going to be named The Mandalorian after Baby Yoda. I don't think at this point that it is. I think that what we're doing is we are setting this series up to have more investment in the Din Djarin character. Um, get some space from Baby Yoda. Well, hey, still letting him do cute Baby Yoda things. Uh, give me your green Oreos, you know, that sort of thing. Um, now, we're going to be talking about the future of this series, the future of what it is to be the Mandalorian. I do believe that Cara Dune and Grief Karga, uh, as played by Gina Carano and Carl Weathers, are going to be staples, at least of each season. Um... As the Mandalorian travels the universe, he, he'll come back to uh, meet these two. 
this episode, I believe, look, I didn't get to see the credits, uh, but I believe that this episode was directed by Carl Weathers. Carl Weathers' directorial debut, I believe it was. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that. I am not a Carl Weathers expert, but here's what I do know. I mentioned in the reviews for last season, Carl Weathers did not seem to be taking the role of Grief Cargo very seriously. He was way overboard with this character last season, playing it sort of loose. He did not seem to be taking things all that seriously. It seems that in the offseason, he understood how big this role really is, how big an opportunity this really is, and invested a little more. There was not as much loose acting in this episode as he had in the previous season, but there was quite a bit of overacting, if I do say so myself. Last season, he seemed to have mailed it in a good deal of the time. This season, his acting seems very good at times, uh, but also seems a bit over the top from time to time as well. Perhaps part of that is the difficulty that comes or would be to come with directing oneself. I do not know. But it seems to be a much different character than he played, than he portrayed in the first season. Uh, he's taking it a lot more seriously, it seems. Also, seeming to take things seriously is Gina Carano. I don't know. I haven't watched anybody's review of this uh, episode yet. Um, normally I watch two or three um, reactions at some point during the week. Um, but am I alone in thinking that Gina Carano seems to have been taking this role seriously enough to get puffy? Puffy-faced? For anyone who knows the reference, knows the culture, you will understand what I mean by puffy. I am not here to make accusations. But, not all that foreign to Hollywood to see this type of puffiness pop up. Especially in superhero movie culture. As we find ourselves enraptured in that type of uh, culture. The constant flow of superhero movies that happens Except for this year, because this year is hell on earth. So, she definitely seems bigger. Maybe I'm wrong, but she definitely seems bigger. Maybe. Maybe it's just creatine. I don't know. I am not here to make accusations. I'm not here to judge, either. If someone wants to get puffy, get puffy. Hey. A little bit of a... A little bit of P. Diddy. A little bit of Puff Daddy. A little bit of a side action there. Um, Metachlorian count. We get the M count, the dreaded M count, which I understand uh, was a great fear coming into this season. But this this series has done a good job of reclaiming what was the uh, prequel series. We get little references, little nods back to them, um, including the pit droids, right? Including um, the Wild West cowboy guy's ship was apparently uh, one of the uh, pod racers from the prequels, right? I think um, it looked like the one that Anakin had used. I don't know. I don't know if this was ever referenced. I don't know if this was ever confirmed, but it sure looked like it, right? I remember from the video game. Um, my neighbor had the video, the pod racer video. Why am I doing this? Um, had the pod racer video game and it had the uh, Zebulba. The, all the pod racers on there, and that was Anakin's. Was I think that was Anakin's with the um, the thing that uh, Wild West guy was writing. Another video game that he had, by the way, that I went over there and uh, was such a fan of was Resident Evil, the first Resident Evil. Am I the only one who got first video game Resident Evil vibes when the doc popped up and we were getting his log there? Uh, that is something that was absolutely famous. From the first Resident Evil game, you would find all of these journals from the doctors, and then all of a sudden the doctor pops out of the closet in zombie form, and you got to take him down, whatever. But there were all of these um, weird creatures, weird experiment creatures that were failed experiments displayed there as the doctor popped up and did a little bit of explaining about what the weird failed experiment creatures were. That felt very Resident Evil. And I'm a fan of it. But while we're talking about references, um, I'm not a big pop culture guy. But this episode had a whole lot of pop culture in it. 
the very beginning with Baby Yoda and the Mandalorian trying to fix the ship, who didn't think uh, that that was a reference to Baby Groot and Rocket in Guardians of the Galaxy 2 when he was saying, don't press this button. I need you to go into the heart of the planet and I need you to set this thing, but don't press this button. That scene was very uh, reminiscent of the scene in Guardians of the Galaxy and um, it even had Baby Yoda getting fried. Uh, so that was interesting to me. Another reference that never happened, that didn't happen, and I think the reason it didn't happen is we got TIE Fighters. And am I wrong that TIE Fighters are powered by the Wilhelm Scream? Is that or is that not the Wilhelm Scream? I've always thought that the TIE Fighter was the Wilhelm Scream stretched out. Uh, but we don't get the Wilhelm Scream when that... Um, Stormtrooper falls into the lava pit. I so wanted the Wilhelm scream at that moment. Did anyone else? Surely I'm not the only. That's a pop culture reference. It's more of a guy movie reference, but it's a pop culture reference. Uh, there are, by the way, documentaries on YouTube about the Wilhelm scream that are definitely worth watching if you were in to that sort of thing. Um, another reference that we got uh, that I have to believe was put in there. I have to believe this is a reference. You've got the speeder trooper. What are they called? The speeder trooper during the chase scene, which part of my episode glitched out. Let me know if this happens to you as well. Um, it glitched out there and it glitched out at the end. There's two minutes, I think, at the end of the episode I didn't get to see because my episode glitched out. Um, what was I saying? Oh, right. Um, one of the... Stormtroopers is on top of the ship and he's getting ready to throw basically a grenade into the ship. Uh, sort of a reference to every World War II movie you've ever seen where there's on top of the tank, right? But also, at that moment, Grief Karga turns the gun around. Bop, 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 bop. Tell me. That did not make you think of the, the scene from Rambo that has been turned into the thumbs up gif, right? where he just turns that 50 cal on the guy standing in front of the 50 cal and blows him away. Uh, great scene. I'm talking about the Rambo scene. Great scene. Uh, there is a review, by the way, on this channel for the latest Rambo movie. I'm hoping, I really am hoping, as Sylvester Stallone is a legend in Hollywood, that Rambo gets recast um, and the legacy gets continued possibly by rebooting the whole thing um, with a different actor. I don't know who it would be, but uh, it, I, I think that that's got to happen. I think this has to be one of those generational characters. But yeah, that was definitely, I think, a reference to that scene. A guy movie reference, right? That's a guy movie. We're getting references to guy movies in this show. And yeah, all the Wild West movies, the Spaghetti Western movies, uh... I'm waiting for a, a reference to Two Mules for Sister Sarah. I want a Two Mules for Sister Sarah episode. Um, maybe we've already got it. If we have, tell me in the in the comments. I would love to reminisce about which episode that would have been. Where am I in my notes? Oh, yeah, here we are. Something for which Star Wars is very famous. Selling toys. Who does not believe that at some point we're going to see more of those indoor trooper, speeder bike troopers in toy aisles? Who does not believe that at some point there's going to be a Cara Dune action figure that just so happens to fit right inside one of these tank toys? These, uh, what is the tank ship that they were in that they stole? Who doesn't think we're going to see that? Who doesn't think that we're going to see a baby Yoda with green vomit all over his, uh, his chest? I have to believe that there is a Funko Pop for that right now. If you haven't seen, there are Funko Pops of Baby Yoda that just came out for the holiday season. And I think there's about nine of them because of the numbers that are skipped on the back of the box. I, I just know because we carry them where I work and it's interesting to see. We've got four different ones uh, at, the, at the place where I work. So it's interesting to see those things pop onto the shelves just in time for Christmas season. Um, which was one of the big gripes last year, don't you remember, that right before Christmas, we get Baby Yoda, 
and there's no merchandise. But I will say, I do and I do respect the fact that the reason there was none is that doing so would have opened up potential spoilers for the series, and it cost Disney millions, maybe a hundred million dollars, that there was no Baby Yoda merchandise that first year. And guess what? They didn't do it. They stuck to the principles. They kept that thing a secret and they didn't do it. I have to commend that. And it's one of the reasons. Had the Baby Yoda thing been spoiled, I understand the... I understand the vitriol that comes from the Star Wars fandom. I really do. Um, while and whereas I don't understand it to the full extent that a Star Wars fan uses that vitriol. I, I don't understand because I'm not, I'm not a Star Wars guy. I understand how bad the sequel movies are. I understand how bad the prequel movies were. I understand how long people have wanted good content about this franchise. If the Baby Yoda thing had been spoiled, that fandom, being as beaten down as they are, would have taken the phrase Baby Yoda and just gone to town with how terrible that would have sounded in, in forecast, right? Um, and I, I can understand that. I can understand the fact that that would have sounded like sacrilege to the Star Wars fandom. We're going to get a baby Yoda? Don't give me this shit, right? I can understand that. But because it was not spoiled, it took everyone by surprise. I don't, this is sign language for surprise, by the way. I don't know if you know that. It took everyone by surprise and it was a hit. And I understand that there was some Star Wars fan, the, the the fandom menace, right? Uh, there was some of the fandom that that held out on the Mandalorian. Oh, it's the Mandalorian. It's terrible. Uh, all of this stuff. And I can understand that. You, that fandom had been so beaten down for so long uh, that something which is, uh, I think, even at its worst, the Mandalorian is pretty good. And I can understand how that would be um, seen or construed. I think construed because I think it is pretty good. I think the series is pretty good. I think that the first season was pretty good. Um, but I'm, again, coming at it from as an outsider. Sign language for outsider. Um, sign language for Fassbender, right? Kill Fassbender. Um, I can understand the apprehension there. Um, I got lost. I got sidetracked. What am I talking about? That was 9, 10 is... Oh, yeah. During the escape scene. Here's what I didn't understand. I have given a whole lot of credit to the writers here, to the actors here, to the um, direction here. During that chase scene with the TIE fighters and the tank ship, the blue guy, who I thought was a pleasant surprise to see again, um, weird dynamics between him and Grief Karya. I have to say weird dynamics there, weird person owning person dynamics there. But um, during that scene, he spouts off, we're almost there. As they're it, towards the end of that uh, fight scene, almost there doesn't mean anything when you're being chased by TIE fighters, right? When you're being chased by... So, um, TIE fighters, as I understand, in the Star Wars mythos, are sort of like the, uh, the very feared Japanese and German... Um, well, the, the German jets, for sure, in World War II, but also the uh, the Japanese fighters were very feared as well. As I understand, that is what almost there doesn't matter. You're not going to a military base. Where were you going? To that weird little town that you came from? No one there is going to save you. Being chased by TIE fighters, these are very formidable ships. Um... We're almost there seems to have been the script predicting the script and our heroes being bailed out by more heroes. Uh, so that I, I'm starting to get weary of this. Uh, things are so destitute in our situation that we have to be bailed out uh, from the outside. 
Um, so that is that. At the end, when the X-Wing pilot that has now appeared, I think, in three episodes, two or three episodes, maybe it's just two, uh, when he showed up, Brief Cargo was giving him a lot of slack. This is Old West, right? Don't send your don't send your approved troops out here. They've got no place. We have our own law, we have our own order, and things are rough, but we don't need you. This is very Wild West. This is very colonial. This is very American spirit. Right after that scene, uh, that fella goes out and he talks to Cara Dune. And Cara Dune says, I'm not a joiner. I'm going to have another video where I reference this same argument here on the channel. It's going to be not, it's not going to be related to this. It's going to be related to the hashtag walkaway stuff. But, um... I'm not a joiner. That is very Sigma type personality. That is very American spirit. That is where we're going here. But that stinger at the very end of this conversation where he sets down that little emblem, uh, I don't know to what exactly that reference is, but I get it. What he's doing is he's poking her sense of duty. This is the same way that the Mandalorian is often cajoled into helping people. Oh, I thought that Mandalorian armor meant something, right? Um... I thought you were a real man, right? That is sort of what is going on here. Uh, so it is interesting to see that. And that little town that they're in on that planet, it feels half Old West, half medieval. It's made up like a medieval town with an Old West attitude. And when you think about it, you have to believe that medieval towns, and I've never thought about this before, Medieval towns would have that same mindset. Uh, that same mindset of, we're here on our own. We've got to fend for ourselves. We've got to supply for ourselves. We've got to be whatever it is that we can be because there's no guarantee of anyone coming through to help. Um, this feels... I've never correlated those two, uh, but that is how it feels. The last note I have again is, I lost about five minutes at the end of this, which was a lot of it was the end of credits, but there was that scene with Moff Gideon that I can preview on the little tracker below, you know, but I can't see it. And I also lost a little bit during that chase scene. I don't know if that is to do with Disney Plus or if it is from the fact that I have Spectrum Internet that I have to reconnect to every three and a half minutes, but that is all. I have to talk about this episode of The Mandalorian. I would love to have you back for the next episode review of The Mandalorian. I am hoping to do more reviews as I do now have Disney+. Plus. I am hoping to do reviews on the entire Marvel series. The Marvel movies are, are, are uh, something that I take a great interest in. I need to set aside some time to do reviews on those movies. I've binge-watched a few of them in my laziness the past few weeks. Um, if you don't know, if you only know me from this channel, I also run Stripped Cover Lit, where I talk about books, poetry, short stories, literature, writing, those sorts of things. Um, I'm hoping to get into a whole lot more here on this channel as well. I apologize for my recent absence on, absence on both of these channels. I was a little bit um, burnt out, but I have to say, I do work overnight, so these are my normal hours of operation. Uh, I'm able to catch the Mandalorian as it is uh, dropping. But um, one thing, apparently Kansas City, I, I live in Kansas City, apparently we're going into lockdown again. So I'm not going to have anywhere to go on my days off. So uh, screw you, Kansas City. Screw you, COVID. Uh, but I will have a whole lot more time if I don't fall into the depths of depression in order to shoot shows. So uh, if you are not subscribed and you somehow made it 30 minutes into this episode, maybe hit the subscribe button and come back because I will be back with all sorts of content on this channel. Uh, this channel is not married to any one type of content. Uh, stripped cover lit is, but I will be doing a lot of my um, nonfiction reading on this channel. 
which will include eventually Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, one of the foundational Stoicism texts. And if you enjoy The Mandalorian, you would enjoy some Stoicism. So come back for 